G'day, g'day There you go and What do you know He'll strike a light G'day, g'day And how you go And just say g'day, g'day, g'day And you'll be right Now turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8 as we continue our journey through the Bible, Acts chapter 8, and we'll be picking up from where we left off last time in verse 26 through 40, and the title of this message is Divine Appointments, Divine Appointments, and let's read verses 26 through 31 just so we have a bit of a context to launch into. It says in verse 26, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of the great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit of, said to Philip, go near and take over this chariot. So Philip ran and took and ran to him. And he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and says, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, as we look at this amazing passage, as we close out this chapter, we see principles of ministry, of evangelism, but we also see the obedience of Philip here, just trusting you, walking in your spirit, led by you. And uh, and we pray that we'd all have that same heart to follow you no matter what, to obey you no matter what, no questions asked. And so I pray that uh, the lessons that you want to speak to all of us here today, that we would take heed and that we'd be doers of your word and not just hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. To kind of give a bit of a backdrop again so we understand the context as we started uh, this chapter last week, we saw how the Lord raised up Philip, another one of those seven we already read in chapter 7 with uh, Stephen and how he was martyred for the faith. And so Philip, uh, who was also another one of those individuals who was waiting on tables, just serving behind the scenes, uh, but he had a heart for evangelism. He had a missionary heart. And um, so he uh, was sent out uh, from Jerusalem to go down to Samaria because of the persecution breaking out. And again, ultimately, uh, he's responding to the Great Commission to go out and preach the gospel everywhere. And as the Lord says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you know, uh, that uh, you'll be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the end of uh, the most parts of the world. And that's what is taking place here. So he goes down to Samaria, preaching the gospel message to the people there. Again, the persecution uh, is moving the gospel message uh, throughout the region, even to the uttermost parts of the world. So as Philip goes down, we start to see this amazing move of God taking place, revival breaking out, people getting saved, people getting set free, people being healed. And you notice in verse 7 and 8, we see how these unclean spirits came out, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. Radical work of God taking place. And with many people being saved, and uh, with the Samaritans hating the Jews, you're seeing just healing, reconciliation. We also see how Peter and John go down to help out the work there, and they also represent the Jewish Christians. And in doing so, they're going to tell these Samaritan believers that they are too a part of the body of Christ. It's not a, a division there or a separate group there. They're all a part of the family of God in Christ Jesus. And that must have also brought more great joy to their hearts. And so Peter and John, they lay hands on them. They receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. And, um, and as we're going to see this morning, and, and part of the theme in this next section that we're seeing here in, in main point, uh, as we mentioned, it's about obedience. Just trust in the Lord. Just be, it, that obedience factor, as Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And, and that's sometimes the hardest thing for us to do because it's an obedience factor and, and we've got rebellion in our hearts and our lives. There will be times it does not make sense to us to do something. 
It may not be what you're thinking, but when God calls you to do something for him, uh, you need to be obedient to what he's telling you to do. And the question is, are we obedient to what he's telling us to do? And, and that's what it comes down to. And this is where we see great fruit, great ministry does take place, great blessing when you obey him. So let's look at Philip, what he did again. And again, keep in mind, revival's breaking out in Samaria, great move of God taking place. And um, many are being set free and healed. Um, and, and so with that as a bit of a backdrop, notice verse 26. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Go uh, Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And he arose and went. And we'll pause right there. Now, if you think about this for a moment, imagine if you're involved in this ministry and people were getting saved by the hundreds or even thousands, okay? And this great awakening taking place. Uh, and, and the angel of the Lord appears out of nowhere and tells you to move on from this area uh, and this work taking place. What would you do? Really? Get behind me, Satan, right? We, we would be our probably first response. Oh, you got to be kidding me. And if you think about it, only the devil perhaps would want the work to stop. Uh, and that's what we might be thinking, but we would be wrong. You see, God is very clear in what he wants us to do. That's not the problem. The problem comes when we don't agree what he's telling us what to do. It, it is a lot easier when it comes down to it to do what he tells us to do, no matter how difficult, how hard it may be, than to face the consequences of not doing it. Okay, That overrides the problem. So if we were to learn our lessons quickly, just do what he tells you to do. If you listen, obey the first time, you'll never have a problem. That's what I tell my kids. <laughs> but as we look at Philip here and what he's facing, he's leaving this area of habitation, of lusciousness, of lives being there, fertile area, to go down to a barren area. Notice the word there, this is desert. But this is where he wanted him to go. And we've seen the angel Lord appear in various times throughout Scripture. He appeared to Hagar, to Abraham, to um, Moses, to Elisha, Gideon, Balaam, um, Joseph, uh, to Zechariah, the shepherds, uh, Peter in jail, as we saw in chapter 5. So we see the angel Lord doing this communication. And in this instance, the angel of the Lord directed Philip to go south. And Philip, with one single question, without even a single question, we don't even see anything here. Maybe he did. We don't know. Nothing's recorded. He got up and went. Notice that. He got up and went. So that's obedience on the part of Philip. He didn't question the Lord. He didn't need to know why he needed to go down to Gaza. All Philip knew was that God had called him and he got up and went. If you struggle finding the will of God, know this. God's will for you is that you obey him and what he tells you to do one step at a time. He doesn't give the full story. He doesn't give us all the details. Just take the first step. He just says, I want you to go down to the desert. And once you do that, I'll show you the next step. And that's why I believe the Christian life is incredibly exciting. Because you never know what lies ahead. You just take that first step and you see what the Lord does. And I bet you there's a lot of people wonder why they're not being used to the full capacity that they think they should be used. Maybe it's because God's called them, but they refuse to go. They refuse to do. They refuse to whatever the Lord's put on their heart to do. Maybe they're too comfortable, and they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. Maybe they're just too busy for the Lord and too busy to fit God into their schedule. But you see, God uses human instruments to do his work, and he wants to use you. And we've got to let him, though. We've got to listen to his voice, be sensitive to him. And may we follow the Lord, listen to his voice, his direction, because he is the great shepherd, and he leads us to where we need to go for the work that he wants us to do. And he does that work in you, and he does that work through you. So it's a blessing in both ways. But God handles the details. 
He sets up the appointment. He, the, the time of the arrival of the Ethiopian eunuch, as we're going to see, and, and how Philip caught up with them to read at the right passage, to have the right conversation. The timing of the Lord is amazing. But you see, it is God's sovereign work plus man's obedience to what God has called them to do that brings the touch of God to the needy human lives. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this particular instance in this story. Now keep in mind that God was not only working on the heart of Philip, but he's also working on the Ethiopian eunuch's heart as well. So verse 27 continues, And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So in the sovereign strategy of God, Philip was sent to this area uh, where he met this Ethiopian eunuch, and, and the eunuch here, there's a couple of different ideas. One, it's just a title, it's a position. Some think it's an emasculated male. So there's different ideas here and different uh, reasons behind that. But either way, he's traveling home from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, uh, south of uh, Egypt. Now, we encounter this Ethiopian who was in charge of this treasury. Uh, you might say he's the minister of finance uh, for the queen. And... By the way, her name is not Candace. Candace was more of a title of official position like Pharaoh or Caesar in Rome. Uh, so that's more of what's the idea behind that. And so, but the fact that this court official, this minister here, was in charge of her entire treasury tells us that he was in extremely high place in the government there. Very influential. Probably second, maybe third in charge of the land. And yet, something was missing in his life. He didn't have God. He had his power. He had his prestige. And, and yet he was missing something as he was traveling from Jerusalem for a business trip. And perhaps, again, he was there to worship uh, the Lord. Um, and the, the true and living God was known by the Jews. And, and, and they were there to share that with others. But there was a big problem here. Is that he went looking for the Lord. He didn't find God uh, in the law. And that is what was the primary push of Judaism. It was with the law and the commands uh, and the rituals within the temple. And so he left seeking after the Lord, left Jerusalem empty. And let me clarify that. He went to Jerusalem to find God and found nothing. But when he was there, he happened to purchase the book of Isaiah, a scroll at the time. Uh, very costly in those days. And perhaps a rabbi he saw and, you know, he was able to purchase it off of him. And uh, perhaps this is one of the scrolls of, from the Dead Sea, uh, which is probably, you know, 20 to 24 feet long. And in fact, if you go to Israel today and you go to the shrine there, you see it's through this bulletproof glass. Perhaps it, it, it could have been that one. I'm, I'm sure that there's other copies that they had there. But he left Jerusalem with the word of God. He wanted to find God, and that's why he was reading the, the scroll of Isaiah. But he didn't understand what he was reading, at least not yet. So this man is still searching, and that's why I said he left not finding God, but God is going to use the word to witness to Philip to bring him to save in faith in Jesus Christ. So, And I, and I think we all understand the, the power of the word of God. You know, when we believe it, it's living in power for sharper than any two edged sword. Also, Paul reminds us of Romans ten seventeen. So faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And uh, the question is, do you believe it? Uh, or when Paul says in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of, of Christ, for it is the power of God of salvation for everyone who believes it. You know, and the question is, do we believe it? So we need to trust what God is telling us through his word. The word will not return void, but it will accomplish what he pleases. And so even though he might have left Jerusalem without having a, that encounter, relationship with the Lord, God's going to use this opportunity as he reads the word and how it's going to be explained to him. And so with this Ethiopian, he leaves with the scroll of Isaiah. He's reading it, but as we'll see, he doesn't understand what he's reading. Uh, let's go on to see what um, Philip's going to do. Verse 29, 
Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and take, overtake this chariot. This proves to me that the Lord will do whatever it takes to reach someone for him. Okay? Crazy stuff like this, whatever it takes to reach someone for the Lord. Um, and there's no excuses when it comes to on Judgment Day. No one can say, well, I really wanted to know you, God, but I couldn't figure out how. If you're searching, God will reveal himself to you. And use circumstances, use people in your life, uh, questions, concerns uh, that will wake us up and draw us in that direction. Now, with Philip, he was ready to witness, but there's a lot of people that don't like to witness. Why? Well, perhaps they don't know how, right? Uh, sometimes they're just not, not sure of how to witness effectively with people. Sometimes there's indifference. Uh, there's other things to think of, other things to do. I don't have time to witness. Or perhaps there's f uh, uh, fear uh, where you, you know, perhaps you don't want to be made a fool of. You, know, you don't know how to answer a question uh, that someone may be asking. Or perhaps maybe a bad experience. Uh, you tried, but it didn't go so well, so you're just not even going to go there. Or maybe you've seen it done the wrong way. You have the just witness type. These are kind of like the bounty hunters, you know. They go down, <coughs> you, know, sh you know, wanting to share the gospel with anything that moves and really no tact or anything like that. They're kind of rude, offensive evangelists. But hey, I witnessed today. You know, so they're kind of a blowhorn guy, just repent and believe, you know. So whatever it takes, you know, there, there's in-your-face type people. And then you have the other just believe type, you know, like the Nike evangelist. You know, just do it. And uh, they just want to seal the deal. The unfortunate part with this is I believe there's so many false professions have been made because they don't know why they need to make a decision for Christ. They're just trying to, hey, as many people as we can get, raise their hand, you know, but you don't know why you're raising your hand, you know, or coming forward at an altar call, you know, but, but hey, we got the numbers or whatever. And then there's some just, I just got to live it out, bro, you know, just, just, just to live it out. Um, and they believe in the silent witness approach, and it's really lopsided because living out the gospel without explaining the gospel is like trying to fly a plane with only one wing. You'll never get off the ground. Even Jesus didn't do that. He explained, he taught, he spoke, he described, he educated people in sin and repentance and believing. So not only did he live it, but he also spoke it. And again, in Matthew 4, 7, from that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or even Romans ten fourteen, how shall they hear, not see, how shall they hear without a preacher? So leading other people to Christ requires that we be ready, that we be unafraid, that we're able to use the Word of God and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not complicated. You know, you love Jesus, and the more you're in love with Him, it just flows into, you know, out of your life. And people want, I want what you've got. You know, well, here's, here's you know, what it's about. So verse 30 continues. So Philip ran a, uh, to him. And heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I understand <clears throat> unless someone guides me? And so he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So notice that Philip didn't procrastinate. I'll get around to it. It's not on my calendar. I'm free maybe next month or whatever. But he ran to catch up to the char chariot and specifically the man who was reading uh, in the chariot. So when God calls us to do something, are we that enthusiastic in doing it? Or are we more like, well, I guess I'll have to do it if I have to, you know, if I get around to it, you know. When God calls you to do something, you're excited. There's a little bit of an, um, reservation in our heart because we don't know how it's going to be, but that's part of the excitement. Just go out in, in faith, and, and, and we should be excited to go everywhere God calls us to go and do those things that he calls us to do. He gives you everything that you need. You know, If you're walking in the Lord and walking in the Spirit, he gives you whatever you need, but you've got to do your part. Be prepared. Prepare your heart. Prepare your mind. Know the Word. Uh, be a, a man or woman of prayer. And maybe sometimes our lack of enthusiasm is that we're not filled with the Spirit. You know, people are lacking the Spirit uh, in their life. Um, and, and we're, you know, just that empowerment that we need uh, to shine for Jesus. May we be like Philip here. 
Uh, when, when God calls us to go, that we don't hesitate. We, we don't make excuses why we can't go. Uh, but we go forward because we're full of the Lord and we can't stop. Uh, we're enthusiastic. We run to where God wants us to be. And you see what God does in your life in those situations. And what a blessing it is to minister. You become addicted. You know, you can't wait for the next ministry opportunity, next divine appointment. You know, and, and hopefully every day something happens. Lord, today, you know, who can I speak? Who can I share with? Who can I pray for? Who can I encourage? You know, and, and you look at how the Lord orchestrated all these events on this dusty, dirty road, this desert road. You know, the e- eunuch, he's searching for the true and living God. His life is empty, not complete, and, and God brings Philip to reveal to him, you know. And there's no excuses why people don't know God, as we mentioned. Because in Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. So if you're truly searching for God, he will reveal himself to you. Or the person in Timbuktu. Or whatever. There's no excuses. If someone's really wanting to know the Lord, God will make himself known to them. His promises is that we'll find him. If we search for him with all the heart, God desires to make himself known and he gives us even creation to point us there. And that's what Romans chapter one even talks about, you know? So, and even Romans chapter two, you're without excuse. If you have the law, you'll be judged by the law. If you don't have the law, you'll be judged without the law. Creation reveals the handiwork of God. So this Ethiopian eunuch, he was looking for the Lord and ultimately looking for a relationship with the living God and God's going to reveal himself to him. So Philip, he catches up to this chariot, probably heard the man reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And keep in mind, this man had a lot of power. He had a lot of influence, but that didn't matter to Philip. And there's probably this whole entourage there. Who's this guy coming up here? Secret service coming up to stop him or whatever. But here's this man who needed to hear Jesus. May we never forget that though. May we not put people into categories of importance and those who may not be important. We are all important to God. He died for us all. And that's the first and most important part of evangelism. Everyone matters to God, regardless of what color, what what country, what sex, whatever. Everyone matters to God. And so the Spirit of God spoke to Philip to go to this chariot to witness to him. And Philip was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and he obeyed what God told him to do. And, and, and you see the enthusiasm and the excitement of, of Philip here. He ran to the chariot. That's exciting. He didn't walk. He didn't gingerly. He ran there. There's enthusiasm there. He could hardly wait to do what God is telling him to do in this situation. And, and notice Philip didn't say, well, I don't want to witness to a person of that color of skin or of that ethnic background or that culture, you know, how can a puny little layman like me witness to a secretary of treasury? Or I don't want to, uh, you know, m- you know, touch base with those of those social, you know, weirdos like the emasculated Jews or males. Uh, I, I can't witness to this man. He's out of my social class. You know, there's all kinds of excuses that people may have. No, Philip ran to witness to him. And when he got alongside the chariot, he heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. And in the ancient manuscripts, as you know, there was no punctuation or uh, verse and chapters. It's like all the words kind of ran together. So it's often the custom. They read it slowly and they read it out loud. That's why they were doing that. Now, you can just imagine how puzzled, how bewildered uh, the uh, eunuch's face was when he tried to comprehend uh, what he was reading. It was all Greek to him. You know, that's the only translation they had at the time, you know, because it was the uh, Septuagint version. Now, how did Philip know where the eunuch was reading from? Well, because Philip was a man of the word. He knew the scriptures. And I encourage you to be a man and a woman of the word. You know, read through the word of God on your own. Study it on your own. You know, and it's great to have a, a place to, to fellowship and, and that teaches your word, but we need to study on our own, devour it on our own. As Peter says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense uh, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and unfear. 
and not only to give a good defense, but to, to, to bring salvation to the people. As Paul said in Romans you know, 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God of salvation for everyone who believes. You know, there's power in it. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. And Philip asked him, again, do you understand what you're reading? He said, I can't understand unless someone guides me. You see, the word of God is open to us by the spirit of God, and sometimes God will use others to speak forth the truth of God uh, found in the word for people to see. So sometimes we're reading something, you can grasp it. Sometimes we read something, we don't understand it. And so we need it explained to us. And there's going to be times that there are people around that they may even twist the scriptures. That's why it's so important for you to know what the word of is, word of God is, and rightly divide the word of truth. And um, that's why it's so important to know the word. So this Ethiopian asks Philip to come up sit with him and explain what it means. And so let's read on to see what this portion of Isaiah he's reading from. Verse 32, the place in the scripture which he read was this, and he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before the shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip, and says, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Talk about amazing luck. This eunuch was reading out of Isaiah 53 of all places. But again, we know that there's no luck. It's all the hand of God. There's no coincidence and there's no accidents in the kingdom of God. Now, in a modern time, you know, say you're at the airport waiting to catch a plane and you have this person sitting next to you who opens up his Bible and he starts reading John chapter 3. And as he's reading through there, maybe out loud, maybe silently, and you know he's going to get to verse 16, right? It's quickly approaching and God prompts on you to ask him to say something. How unusual it is to find someone reading their Bible at the airport. Isn't that the third chapter of the Gospel of John? And the stranger turns to you and says, that's interesting. I'm stumped on verse 16. Can you explain to me what verse 16 tells me? You know, thank you, Jesus. And then you go for it. That's kind of what's taking place here in the Old Testament with Isaiah 53. And you can't get any more clear than the Gospel presentation in the Old Testament there. And, and if you think about the odds of where he was reading in the book of Isaiah. Keep in mind, as we mentioned, there's no chapter, uh, verse, divisions. That was added much later on, much later on. And again, those weren't inspired, as we've mentioned before. But to give you an idea how amazing this is, as you know, there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. You can split it up into two parts, kind of like a mini Bible, 37 in the old, 27 in the new, right? Split right around chapter 40. But there's 1,252 verses, which consist of um, 3,000 or 37,040 words. And out of those words, he's reading these 45 words. It's amazing how this is all coming together. And yet he doesn't know who he's speaking of. And if you think of all the odds there, yet the Lord, this was nothing, right? Nothing's too hard for the Lord. This is where this man needed to be. And... He needs to be reading this, and he needs to understand this. And at this particular time, where he's at, coming to this place in the desert where he's reading, you see the timing of God is amazing. Now, I believe that God's word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, as Hebrews uh, 4.12 tells us. And, and, and it changes our lives if we allow it to. And I don't care if we're teaching out of the book of Acts or Exodus, Leviticus, through the Gospels, Ephesians doesn't matter. God has us where he wants us to be and to learn from any book of the Bible. Uh, he has lessons for us to learn and to grow by. And there's no accident that you're here today or for those are in other churches that they're sitting under the teaching of God's word. So as he reads this portion of scripture out of Isaiah 53, again, dealing with the suffering servant, he wanted to know who the prophet was speaking of. Was it of himself or some other man? And this is perhaps, as we mentioned, the greatest Old Testament passage about the Messiah. And it gives truth of the gospel as clear than any other text in the scriptures. So God had prepared Philip that he would arrive 
that the eunuch was reading the gospel passage here. So God's timing's perfect, and the Ethiopian was ripe for fruit and ripe for harvest to be picked by Philip the evangelist. Now, as we know, this passage here in Isaiah 53 is all about the suffering um, servant of Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah. So the Ethiopian eunuch was probably reasoning, if this is a reference to the Messiah, why must he die? Why must he suffer? Because he, he couldn't match this concept with the other Old Testament passages that talks about the reigning of the Messiah, that he was the great prince, he's the conqueror who would deliver uh, oppression and suffering, the one who reigns and sets up the glorious kingdom. So, so what's this talking about? I'm a little confused. If this is the Messiah, how could he understand the suffering and the reigning here? So the eunuch begged Philip for an answer. He, he was hungry to know the truth here. So let's read on verse uh, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. So Taking advantage of this opportunity to explain the gospel, Philip asked him if he understood what he was reading. Again, Philip followed the Spirit's leading. He began the discussion for where he was at. This passage of Scripture, this is why it's so important to know the Word of God, that we should be able to preach Jesus from any part of the Bible, because Jesus is revealed in every part of the Bible. And so when you share the gospel, start where the person's concern is at. Start where they're at where they're focused on, and then bring the gospel to those concerns, to those areas. And we see here that Philip's, uh, again, he was focusing on this passage here that the man was reading from. There was common ground here, and from there he preaches Jesus to them. From Genesis through Malachi in the Old Testament, from Matthew to Revelation in the New Testament, uh, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Every passage, every story, every illustration, everything in some way points to Jesus Christ. It's a picture of him. So why did Philip preach the word? Because it tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. There's power in the word that uh, leads people to salvation. And the unfortunate part today, you see so many churches that are not preaching the word. They're not preaching Jesus. It's about something else or some other uh, direction. And, and it's leaving people anemic in the pews. Um, they're sick. They've got no foundation upon the word. When time, tough times come, they've got nothing to build on. They've got nothing to hold them during those difficult times. And I believe we're living in that time of strong delusion uh, that's happening that Paul wrote, to, uh, wrote about in Second uh, Thessalonians. Uh, the strong delusion coming, that people are believing the lie out there, you know. And if you're not grounded in the Word of God, you're going to be moved by any trick of doctrine out there, you know. And, um, and this is one of the many reasons why we teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, so you know the Word of God, so you won't be deceived. Anyways, back to our passage. Here, this Ethiopian, hearing the word of God, the gospel message is proclaimed to him. And, and notice his response. Uh, verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the, Ethi and the eunuch says, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And, and perhaps maybe baptism came up in the discussion as he was sharing the gospel with them. Could have been one of those triggered thoughts here. Verse uh, 37, then Philip says, but if you believe in your heart, you may. And he answered and says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and he baptized him. This is fascinating because here the eunuch hears the word of God. He hears the gospel message and he responds to it in true salvation. So he tells the man um, that the only way you're going to be baptized is if you believe with your heart. Not mind, but heart. Again, it's important to have the, the knowledge, but it's about the heart. In other words, as Romans 10, 9 through uh, 11 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart, one believes to righteousness with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. It's that simple. So the eunuch responds, I believe Jesus is the son of God. That's the profession of faith. So Philip wants to make sure this man's saved. 
before he baptizes them, which is so important. It's not about the emotions or, you know, just the show, uh, you know, and, and there's all kinds of reasons why some people get baptized. You see, if this man was not saved, he's baptized that, um, you know, would be in vain. And, and he would think that, you know, and, and, and perhaps he's um, just doing it for the emotions, doing it, hey, you know, um, just to, to, to look good. But Philip wants to make sure his baptism um, you know, is real because it's faith in Jesus that saves you, not baptism. You know? And um, baptism, as we know, is that outward expression of what's taking place in a person's heart. And thus, this man's confession that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, God Almighty, and is ready to be baptized, and, and, he, and he comes across this water in this desert and, and wants to be baptized. Now, the, the word for here for baptism, Baptism or baptized is the word baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. So, and here's the cool thing. All his servants were watching this as well. They're, they're watching this thing take place. Uh, the outward expression of what's taking place in sort of the, the eunuch's heart and life. You know, how cool is that? But we also see that it's full immersion. They went down into the water, and you'll see as they come up out of the water, it's not a sprinkling, it's not a, a little dousing, but it's full immersion, okay? And this is why we do our, uh, even uh, thinking of the, the servants watching, why we do our baptisms public. So it's a testimony to the world. As they hear the music, they see the love, they see the testimony, they hear it, uh, the gospel, you know, before we baptize anyone. Now, if you think about it for a moment, this eunuch who left Jerusalem without finding God, maybe he was depressed and now he's got joy. Now we see there's purpose and meaning in his life because he found God or God found him, whatever uh, term you want to you know, use there. He came to the Savior. He came to surrender his life to the Lord. And anyone who has an encounter with God will be filled with great joy because God saved us and he forgives us. You know, and, and just those concepts alone, just it's amazing to see that, you know, we're saved. We're, we're going to spend eternity with Him. Uh, we don't know what happened to the, the servants there. Uh, maybe some of them got saved. We don't know. Maybe some of them were pondering, thinking about it, maybe asking questions on the journey on the way back to Ethiopia. Uh, maybe He witnessed to them how Jesus saved Him. Either way, it's just a great expression and testimony here. Now, everything's going great. And notice what happens next. Verse 39. Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Atos, and uh, passing through, he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So if you can picture what's going on here, Philip left this man out of the water as he brings him up, and then Philip's taken away, okay? Some commentators, they have different views on this, uh, taken away, uh, like um, beam me up, Scotty, you know, type moving transportation type thing in that way. Others see him as he got caught away with such excitement, and they rode away, and, and, and the next thing he knew, he was miles away at this other town. But the word caught up here, it's the same word we get rapture or harpazo, to be caught up. A forceful, sudden action with no resistance. It speaks of miraculous, sudden removal. And I tend to believe the miraculous. I, I like to see this at face value. That nothing's too hard for God to take this man, to take him away into another town, another city where he needs to be. And again... Remember the scriptural rule, if the, the plain te text makes sense, seek no other sense, you know? So what's interesting is this eunuch wasn't sad that Philip's gone. We don't read that here. He was actually rejoicing. Um, and, and you'd think he would be sad or very sad or depressed. Well, this guy who led me to the Lord, now he's gone. Because it's not about Philip, it's about the Lord, you know, our hope and our trust is in the Lord. Our eyes are fixed upon Jesus, not Philip or any other instrument that the Lord may use. And, um, and again, the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. That's a promise that we can hold on to. And it's important for us to understand that God can and will use uh, people in powerful ways in our lives, but keep in mind that they're not God. You know, don't 
have that expectation for them to meet your needs either. And um, they're an instrument that God has used in our lives. And when they're gone, our joy should remain because our joy is in the Lord. Now, we don't know much more about what happened to this Ethiopian from the scripture perspective, but from uh, other extra biblical sources and history tells us that he spread the gospel throughout uh, Ethiopia. Um, even the Coptic Christians in Egypt, uh, who were greatly persecuted uh, even today, uh, they traced their spiritual heritage back to this Ethiopian eunuch. So the gospel message is spreading from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and now to the uttermost parts of the world. And we'll see that take on a whole other shape as we continue on. But here we see Philip, some 20 uh, or 32 kilometers north of Gaza, um, you know, in this other town. And, um, but he was sharing the gospel everywhere he went. And um, just excited to share the Lord with anyone he comes in contact with. Now, jump ahead 20 years later, as we will eventually come to Acts chapter 21, uh, he's still there ministering in Caesarea. And his faith was still strong as ever before. And he has four daughters, four virgin daughters, as it tells us in Acts chapter 21, who prophesied the things of God. So it's an amazing story, amazing you know, uh, situation of obedience, of evangelism, of ministry, and trust in the Lord. Now, before we close, I, I want to spend some time looking at a few uh, verses to deal with the believer's walk. And, and we see this with Philip. We see this with other men or women who've been greatly used of the Lord. And um, Philip perhaps would have never met the Ethiopian eunuch uh, in the desert if he didn't take the first step to go down. What if he didn't respond? We would be reading this story. And thus, it's vital for us to be fruitful to see that all that God has for us, one step at a time. And and when you do that, uh, you'll have so many divine encounters, so many divine appointments. And it's amazing to see what God does there. Now, there's several key principles of evangelism and ministry I want to share with you as we kind of um, start our descent before landing. The first thing and principle is that of walking in love, walking in love. As Ephesians chapter 5 tells us to, is to walk in love as Christ also loved us. That's the first, impo- first and most important thing for us. As Jesus says, you'll, people will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And it's so important for us to understand that we walk in love, we minister in love, and that his love is flowing from our lives. So that's the first thing that we need to understand. And when you start to have that love that's overflowing, ministry just takes place. And it just... It, Instead of someone coming across in an angry way, you know, he could have easily said, you know, if, if Philip was kind of this angry guy for being taken away from this radical work there, imagine his re- potential response, you know, to the Ethiopian. Smoking or non-smoking, right? You know, listen, buddy, you took me away from this very fruitful ministry in Samaria, and I'm, I'm going to make it simple. Turn to Jesus or burn in hell. You know, it's your choice. Come on, I don't have a lot of time. You know, that could have been an angry response. Someone who's not living in love or walking in love, right? There is, secondly, we need to walk in wisdom. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, to walk in wisdom to those who are outside, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And again, let your speech always be seasoned with grace, seasoned with grace and salt, that you may know how to answer each one. So in other words, we need to be wise as we walk. And uh, be aware of those around us that don't know the Lord. Uh, To utilize the time, to utilize the situation that he's placed us in, to redeem the time, um, you know, as you're being led by the the Lord. Um, And and your words will bring conviction into the lives so that people can turn uh, to him. It's so important for us to be walking in wisdom. We need to walk circumspectly also as Ephesians uh, 5 tells us. To walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And so we need to be careful where we're walking. We need to watch where we're going, uh, where we're walking, um, you know, in, in those situations. So, so don't be foolish in getting into some crazy areas unless the Lord has really called you to go minister in those uh, ghetto areas. And, um, but we're to walk in circumspectly, walk in the truth. Uh, if you're not walking in the truth of God, then you're going to be meandering through life. 
you're, you're going to be blown by all kinds of different winds of doctrine or emotions or, or fads. Um, and, and you see this is what's taking place in so many churches and so many people's lives. They're, you know, th- things are happening over here, so they're here for a bit, and then they go over here. There, there's no stability in their life. There's no truth in their life. And um, be careful. Walk in his truth and not what you want to do. Uh, and, and, and I will say this, that when you're walking in his truth, he will give you the desires of your heart, as it says in uh, Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and feed on his word. Trust in his faithfulness and he will do it. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that's the thing. As you're seeking him and walking with him, he's going to place you in those um, areas that uh, is going to fulfill those desires in your life. And then lastly, walk by faith. We're told to walk by faith, not by sight in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And yes, it may not seem right through your own human eyes and perspective as we look at things. Uh, we may even come up with better things or ways to do things. But again, we need to walk as God instructs us to walk because his ways are always best. We may not fully understand why he has us taken this detour to get to point B, but there's a reason. There's things that he wants to work in our life or in the circumstances, or maybe um, that's not ready for us yet, and, and it's going to take time and preparation. And of course, the key is keep walking. Don't stop. Keep walking. As you move forward, take one step at a time, and God will show up, and then you take on step two, and so on. It's not always easy because we don't know how it will all work out, but this is where trust comes in. Uh, feed on His faithfulness. Keep walking in the Spirit, led by Him. And that may be hard now, but remember what He has done in the past, His faithfulness, His strength. Let that help you in your present walk with Him. Amen? And let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your grace and mercy. We thank You for this passage that teaches us about the obedience factor in Philip's life, and may we have the same type of response in our life, that we would trust you with all our heart, with all our mind, and that we would be led by you, we'd be sensitive to you. And as your word says, to trust in you with all our heart, and lean not in our own understanding, in all our ways we acknowledge you, and you will direct our path. And so it's a moment by moment, day by day basis that we need to keep trusting you walking in your spirit. And uh, when you call us to do something, we're not trying to figure it all out and help us not to try to reason there, but just to take those steps of faith, that we walk by faith, not by sight. I pray for each and every one here that they would experience your presence, experience your touch, your healing touch, your provision where it's needed. I pray that you would just minister Uh, to those longing desires that they may have, the questions, the concerns, and that you would just provide those answers and that they would be overwhelmed with your peace that passes all understanding. For those who need healing, that you would touch them right now, that you'd minister to them right now. Those who need deliverance of something in their life that's not pleasing you, that you would set them free. Those who just need just that encouragement that you provide that encouragement or put on someone's heart to come alongside that individual just to encourage them. Like a cup of cold water and a hot day, just that refreshing. And that, that would be our response to everyone that we come in contact with, that we are refreshing and that we minister your love and grace and mercy. So I thank you for your, your word. We pray that we'd be doers of your word and I know you've spoken to each one of us in in different ways and special ways. And I pray that we be obedient to what you're telling us to do. We thank you for this place that we can gather together to worship you and draw close to you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.